So good afternoon again, everyone. We are so glad you could join us today. I am Tammy Welty. I am the Director of Training and Communications at Bradford & Barthel, and I am here with two wonderful attorneys out of our Anaheim office, Gary Sachs and Scott Clark. Gary and Scott are going to talk about settling claims at deposition. I bet that is going to be an awesome topic for our adjusters and our attorneys. Um, take a look at your Zoom menu. At, um, it's at the bottom of this platform. You're going to find a Q&A section. Um, in that Q&A section, you can submit any questions that you have during today's training. We highly encourage questions, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can, maybe some during the webinar, maybe a couple at the end. Um, but go ahead and locate that Q&A section now and show us all that you know how to use it by entering your favorite activity during springtime. So find that Q&A section and enter your favorite activity during springtime. But I have a couple things. It has to be something fun, a fun activity, and you cannot say work. So we do enough in workers' comp, I think. But uh, So let's not say work. Find something fun. And while you're entering that, I'm going to provide you with some information here. We are recording today's webinar, and the video will be posted to our training page at bradfordbarthel.com where you can find close to 100 hours of continuing education videos available to claims adjusters. Today's webinar offers MCLE credit for California attorneys and CE continuing education credits for California workers' compensation claims adjusters. Certificates will be emailed to everyone uh, this afternoon. Uh, all attendees will, must be on the webinar, able to see the slide presentation, and attend for the entire hour to receive credit. Unfortunately, if you are on the phone only and you are unable to see the slides, I will not be able to provide credit. Uh, also, um, in that Zoom menu bar again at the bottom of your screen, find the resources section. In that resources section, I have included six links to our website, which will take you to those CE videos I mentioned. It will take you to our AMA analysis and rating department, our B&B blog, where we strive to release an article or two each week on uh, current workers' compensation topics. You're also going to find links to refer files. And last but not least, there is a link to our attorneys and their profile pages, which is the most looked at area on our website. So B&B attorneys, I know you're on here. Watch out. Everyone wants to see what you look like. Uh, additionally, in that resources section, I have uploaded a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation, and I have included a copy of our 2024 permanent disability money chart cheat sheet. Uh, there's also a third section in that resources area where you can find the speakers, um, and it will have more information about Gary and Scott in there. All right, Mr. Sachs, I love to roller skate in the spring on the bike trails. What do you like to do? Um, I like to walk the dogs in the, I live near the beach, so I go to the beach with the dogs and let them run around. And I play golf on the weekends when it's not raining, but it's been raining the last seven weekends in a row. So yeah, yeah. I'm hoping if we get nice weather this weekend and I could walk the dogs and play golf. That sounds perfect. How about you, Scott? What do you like to do? Um, well, I wasn't going to say it, but I'm with Gary. I'm a crazy nut job when it comes to golf. So any chance doesn't really have to be spring, but um, specifically in the spring, I used to be a, a really avid boater for 15 years in Newport Beach up until very recently, but I still like to go to Catalina when it starts to warm up before it gets ridiculously busy in the summer. But uh, before, before it gets super busy, it's, it's nice to go out there once a year for a weekend. Awesome. Well, let's see what everybody else is saying. So I see a lot of hiking, a um, whole lot of hiking and gardening. Um, yes, um, gardening is supposed to, it's supposed to, don't quote me, but it's supposed to help you live longer. Gardening is really good for you. Camping all day, baseball, bike riding, and the beach, so more beach people, Gary. Uh, swimming. Oh, it's still too cold for swimming, I think. No? Uh, going strawberry picking with the kids. So lots of great stuff here. Thank you guys for participating. Oh, and golf. I'm sorry. There's some golf for you guys in here, too. Quite a few of them. Car shows. Oh, that's a little different. That sounds fun. Um, thank you guys for participating. And uh, don't forget to go to that Q&A if you have questions. I think we're going to move into intros. Uh, Scott, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Scott Clark. I've been a workers' comp defense attorney for 25 years, been with BNB for not quite six years. Um, that's it. I live in uh, Newport, grew up in Orange County. Happy to be here. Thank you. 
Okay, Gary. Yes, I'm, my name is Gary Sachs. I've been an attorney for more than 30 years. I've been with Bradford and Barthel 20 years. I cover the Santa Ana, the Anaheim, Long Beach board. And if you have a special case and you want to send it to me, I can appear almost anywhere. Awesome. Okay, Gary, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Tammy. So the topic today is why are we, how do we settle a claim at a depot? Why did we settle claims at depots? And I think the first thing we should be talking about is why are we taking depots anyway? That's really where we should start. And the point of a depot is we want to know what happened. That's the biggest part of the depot. What what was going on, and you can access you can you can assess the credibility of the applicant on a depot. I personally prefer live depots where I have a person in front of me and I can look in their eyes and I can accept, assess their truthfulness, how they're coming off, and. I know now we have to do it virtually so much, but I'm still trying to look in their eyes. I want to know, is somebody else talking to them? Is the attorney talking to them? Can they get through this uh, um, without, no, I mean, knowing their facts, without having to get help? Also, you tie the applicant down to his story. You should be reading the application, if you get any medical reports first, to see what they're saying the story is. Then when the applicant, you ask them what happened, if it different from the application, if it differs from the medical reports, then you've got a, an, an issue going on. Try and flush it out. Find out why what the applicant's saying is different than the application. If it's different from the medical reports, you want to know when the, when they're reporting the injury. When was the last day of the CT? Why is that a significant day? The day of the specific. Ask him, is this the day that was a specific? Many times on specifics, the applicant's like, oh, no, that's the day I went into the um, applicant's attorney's office. And in fact, there is no specific. Get the body parts down. See what is hurt. 99% of the time, the body parts that are in the application are not the same body parts that the applicant is saying that is really hurt. And you can knock out body parts right then and there. So these are some of the things you find out at the deposition, why you're taking the dip, why are you taking this deposition? Most important to assess the credibility of the applicant. And if I could just pop in here real quick, and, and just for the record, we're probably going to do this a fair amount on each other's slides. So um, thanks for letting me pop in. in. In terms of tying the applicant down to one story, you know, sometimes you get a case, it's a post-term, you say, okay, let's, you know, forget everything, let's go to trial because we've got a slam dunk post-term case. Well, I always, or almost always want to have the deposition of the applicant because the last thing I want to do as your defense attorney is go to trial not knowing exactly what the applicant's going to say. So there's value in that, just so we don't have to ask a question that we don't know the answer to at trial. All right, thanks, That's moving on. true. The other thing is when, he's, when there is a specific, the first thing I say, ask the applicant is, are there any witnesses? Do you have, was anybody watching this? If they say, yeah, um, Joe Smith was there, write that down, call the employer up, say, is there a Joe Smith here? Did, did, and then go and ask Joe Smith, what did you see? What happened? Most of the time they go, I reported this to my supervisor. Go to the supervisor, check the story out. That is a major dish. If they have all these witnesses and you have them in the deposition saying this person saw it, and you parade the witnesses up there and they have conflicting stories, it hurts the credibility of the applicant. Also, prior injuries, especially on same body parts, where did the guy treat? 
you're usually going to, if it's a prior injury, you're going to get apportionment on that. That's the point of it. The most important thing, you got to get the doctors, you got to get the where they treated and get those records because there's major apportionment on prior injuries, prior treatment. And especially if there's the same body parts, you want to know whether they, whether MRIs, you can compare the earlier MRIs to the diagnostics that you're taking now to see if it's, it's getting worse. If it gets better, then you can wash that body part out completely. So get the records. Also, they may reveal other issues when you're looking through it. You can't understand why this person had a foot injury six months ago and it's just not getting better. You ask the applicant, do you have any other injuries or um, conditions that you're not treating now? And the guy and the applicant says no, then you open up the medical records and there are 600 pages of diabetic treatment. He's a type two diabetic. Well, that answers your question on why the his foot is not healing because diabetics, not only that, there's the applicant's credibility. He's covering up other medical issues that he doesn't want you to know about, but the medical records never lie. They always show up. And then you ask the applicant at trial, why didn't you tell me about your diabetes? Oh, I forgot, whatever. But, or if they even say there's diabetic, di, a diabetic issue, I'm a diabetic, and you go through the medical records and it's much worse than he says. There's issues. Post-term issues. Maybe you got, you know, he, his medical records are clean and he says, oh, I always, I had a problem while I'm at work with my arm. Then you get his medical -ish records and it shows He's a skateboarder and he fell three weeks after he lost his job and went in there. Well, there's your arm right there. On a CT claim that it's got to be all there at the time. And let's see that whether we had insurance coverage at the time, whether what he was doing, what his issues were during the time of his CT. And maybe, you know, he never reported the injury. There could be a post-term issue on a specific, definitely. CT claims are harder to do post-terms, but I'm not saying it's impossible. It's very possible to win an AOE COE on a CT, but you've got to have a lot of evidence to enable to do that. Yeah, a lot of times, and sorry for popping in again, uh, on a post-term CT, there's always this pall of sadness that comes over the case. You know, oh, post-term, but it's a CT. You know, I'll, I'll ask the applicant, were you having symptoms while you worked there? What were they? Were there any specific activities you were doing while you worked there? Did you realize at the time you were having these symptoms that they were attributable to your job? Now, a lot of applicants will say, I didn't know because they were prepped by their attorney. But the more you can get the applicant to say about what he knew at the time it was happening, the better your chances, obviously. Absolutely. This is very important. Assess the applicant's disability and limitations. I'm going to give you a good example. Let's say the applicant's complaining about carpal tunnel syndrome. She got pain in her hands, pain in her wrists. She can't do anything. I always look down and see their hands. I want to see, are, do they have a manicure? Are they wearing rings? If you've got severe pain in your hands, you're not sitting there at a manicure at a beauty place getting your fingers done, getting a, a manicure, having them go through your cuticles and paint it and holding your hand. It's, it's, it's the opposite of what you can be able to do. And I'll, I'll, I'll ask them, what can you do with your hands? Are there pain in your hands? And the whole time I'll describe it. The applicant has beautiful hands. She has a manicure. She's wearing four rings. I want the doctor to know because chances are she'll walk into the doctor complaining and there won't be anything on her hands. Surveillance. I want to see if there's a gait issue and the person walks in with no, um, with a, a walker, with crutches. I call up the app, uh, my adjuster and say, give me some surveillance of this guy. Gait is worth a lot. 
with PQMEs, and if they're complaining about gait issues, if they're limping and they're playing it up, exaggerating, I get surveillance on that. If I already have surveillance and I've looked at it, I'm going to ask questions. Do you have problems? Um, let's say the lady's running around the track. Do you exercise? Do you do anything for fun or health? I ask them, do you have a dog? Do you walk the dog? And I always make a joke. I'll say, what kind of dog? Do you have a chihuahua? What? And they laugh and they, oh, yeah, I walk the dog all the time. I want surveillance of her walking the dog. I'm not saying that she, she not, cannot walk her dog. I want to see, does she limp? Is there a gait issue? And there's other things you can find out. Is she going to the store? Is, if she's got an ankle injury, is she wearing high heel shoes? Because I'm sure they're not part of it. I've gotten all that off of surveillance, and he has sent it off to the doctor. So... That's my, I mean, I definitely ask for surveillance. Do you have to reveal the existing surveillance at the depot? Um, you have to, give them the existence of surveillance when you send it to the PQME, you've got to give it to the applicant's attorney first. And he, they now they're all objecting to the surveillance going to QMEs. And I've gone to probably a dozen of those hearings and the judges always let them in. You need to come up with a chain of custody from the provider of the surveillance. But if you go to court with that chain of custody, they're going to let you send it to the PQME. I usually do it at the same time as the depot. I'm going to the PQME. So he usually gets that surveillance right before the depot anyway, because it's still going to the QME. Next. Of course, um, a closed file, everybody knows that a closed file is a happy file. But as a defendant, why are you trying to settle at the depot? Because the earlier you can settle the case, the less it's going to cost you. You're, now with that Batista decision, I'm getting files with seven, eight, nine panels. They're coming up with anything and everything. If you can limit that, the cost of the case going on, you're, you win. I mean, right now, everything's got neuros, internals, neuropsychs, urologies, everything in the book. Let's just end it right now and settle the darn thing and not have to go, every panel is going to cost you five, six, seven thousand dollars and then all the medical tests that come with it, it's better just getting this thing out of there. A, hap a closed file is a happy file all the time. Oh, and if the employer's there and they're all taking it personally, the employer's taking it personally, I hate this guy. I've always hated this guy. He's a grifter. This is a fake injury. I don't want to pay him nothing. Then you're going to, first of all, the first person to talk to the employer should always be the adjuster. The adjust, it's the employer is the adjuster's client. And he should always be talking to the employer about possible settlement. Many times my employer is at the deposition. I've always, I usually try and talk to the employer before the deposition so we, I can explain to him he has to stay somewhat silent during the depot. I let him email me questions as much as possible. But I want that employer to know that most times when we settle the case, his effect will be his X mod goes down. And once they hear that, they're usually on board to try and get the case settled because they may hate the applicant, but they want that low X mod more than their hatred. And I always promise once we settle this, you'll never have to see this guy again. They usually like that part too. There are a lot of necessary steps. There's a lot of work to do before the deposition if you want to try and get it settled. 
it's important that you do all these necessary steps. You have to go through the case. You have to see who the applicant's attorney is. You have to see, are they getting EDD benefits? How old are they? That is a huge deal on, on being able to settle it with a depos on a deposition. You have to look at all these necessary steps before you can just say you, you want to settle the case of the deposition. A lot of people say, well, then I don't have a doctor that found him in my mind, PNS yet. How can I possibly settle the case without him being MMI? There's lots of ways. For If there's diagnostic tests, we've done this for a while. You know what these cases are worth. You look at the MRI. If he's got huge disc bulges in his lumbar spine, you go in the AME guides, you know he's probably a DRE2. You pick the middle of a DRE2, run a rating on it, now you got the lumbar spine. You can do that with almost every body part. You can pretty much project, especially if there's MRIs or diagnostics there. If not, you know if the guy's walking with a with a limp, there's a gait issue. Go in the MRI, the AME guides, look up the gait, put that onto it. We know how to rate. You can go through the the application, come up with the body parts do the deposition, you can rate this stuff and not be that far off. And actually, let me, yeah, let me just add some real, real quick. This is a, an area where, at least in my experience, a lot of settlements are not achieved because for whatever reason, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna blame all defense attorneys, but people don't go that extra step to try to put together a reasonable case value. There's no reason that at least a, a substantive discussion can't take place at the depot. Um, so many depots take place and you get the, the depot report. Well, the applicant's not MMI. We didn't talk about settlement. It's just kind of an afterthought, but uh, there's really no reason for that to happen. And judges will approve CNRs with non-MMI reports. If there's a, a an explanation, a waiver by the applicant for not going to a QME and not having an MMI, if there's an explanation by the applicant and the judge is satisfied with everything, there's nothing a judge can do if the applicant says, I want to get my money, I want to get out of the work comp system, I don't want to treat with work comp doctors. And he writes that down and signs it, there's no MMI report. And the, I've had a, a hundred judges sign orders approving on those reports with no MMI. So that's a myth that they will not approve an uh, CNR without an MMI. And by the way, you save a lot of money by settling on these at the depots. And the applicant's attorney is going to go through a cost-benefit analysis also. He's going to go... Look at this guy's got clean MRIs. I have this case. I'm going to go to a QME and I'm going to get washed out. And once there's a washout report, the value of settlement drops incredibly. It goes down to almost nothing. And the applicant's attorney knows that. He's invested time. He's filed the case. They've set it all up. He doesn't want to walk away with nothing. He's going to get the applicant in the corner and go, tell me the truth. Do you want the money or not? And the applicant, he knows what's going on with this case. So there's a cost-benefit analysis going on on both sides. The defendants are going, I want to cut this off from additional panels and fishing expeditions. And the applicant's attorney is saying, I want to get something for my time and my effort put into this. Oh, 5710 fees, my favorite part. I have a rule that if I'm trying to settle the case, the first thing I ask the applicant's attorney, I tell the applicant's attorney is, we'll pay 5710 fees. And I always get the authority from the adjuster before the depot. I want to say, how much authority do I have? And I want to make sure that app, my adjuster knows I'm going to pay 5710 fees. And I always tell the adjusters, the going rate is 400 bucks an hour, and the applicant's attorneys always want three hours. They're going to get a two, an hour for prep, and most depots last two hours. 
an hour, hour and a half, two hours. So they want three hours at $400 an hour for $1,200. And I always tell them right out of the gate because I can't settle with the injured worker. The applicant's attorney can settle it for me with the applicant's attorney, with the injured worker. He's got pull. In whatever the applicant's attorney, it's very rare that the applicant's attorney said, I think we should settle this. And the injured worker goes, no, I'm not going to do that. It's not as common as you think. 99% of the time, they follow what the applicant's attorney says. And if you can get that applicant's attorney to try and get the applicant to settle for you, you've done, a, a, that's the big hill to climb. The applicant's attorney wants to do it because he's thinking, I'm going to get 1200 bucks for the, my 5710 fees plus 15% of the settlement. He does pretty good for the case settling right at the depot, and he didn't really do anything. The applicant, so I'm just saying the 5710 fees, if you get that applicant's attorney to be doing these the settlement negotiation for you, you're 90% home. And again, the, 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 it's a cost benefit analysis rate of return. The applicant's attorney knows he's getting something out of it. He's getting the 5710 fee, your return on investment. He's not putting all this time in and walking away with nothing. And we're making out because they're not gonna expand the case. We could close the case right now. And the employer's making out because his ex mod's going to go down. So it's a win, win, win for everybody. And just to add a little on this, um, I and mean, Gary kind of mentioned it, but that whole return on investment thing, if an applicant's attorney is going to get, let's say, I don't know, 1200 bucks for 5710 fees, he'll get 1500 bucks on the case in chief. Uh, that's what what I say, 2700 bucks total. And maybe he's only spent five, six, seven, eight hours uh, on the case. Well, that's a certain number of dollars per hour. That might be better for the applicant's attorney, even if we are to pay him twice as much down the road, but he'll have to spend three or four or five times as many hours on the case. So, you know, they're representing their client's interests, obviously, but they're also running a business. You know, they, they, they got to watch out for their bottom line as well. So, and that actually applies to applicants as well. If an applicant can settle for eight, 10, 12, $15,000 up front, where she hasn't, she or he hasn't gone through the the inconvenience, the frustration of going to two years worth of medical appointments and expedited hearings and mileage issues and blah, 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 you know, that applies to them too. So uh, settling cases early as, as early as you can usually works out for everybody. Plus, let's be honest here. A lot of these cases, it's nominal injury, if injury at all, and they know it. And once they go in for the MRIs and diagnostics and everything is clean, the price of settlement just went down dramatically and they're not going to get it. And if they keep asking for the money, you'll go to trial and they'll get nothing. And, you know, 15% of zero is still zero. And they know that and they'll, they'll use it. They'll negotiate at the depot with you. But once the MRIs and everything's in their the truth is being told at that point, and they're not going to get what they think they're going to get. Also, know who the applicant's attorneys are on the case. I mean, we have the famous dichotomy. There's Lee Jacobs who walks into the depots going, what do you got for me? And let's get this out. And I hope you wrote this up because I don't want to spend too much time here. Let's sign these up and get out of here. And then you have another applicant's attorney, Jamie Titel. The joke around the board is he never settles a case till it has a bar mitzvah. It's got to be 13 years old or it's not ripe yet. And you know, okay, Jamie Titel, I don't think he's ever settled a case at a depot. And Lee Jacobs, I don't think he's ever walked out at a depot without a CNR. So know who your opponents are going in. Lots of people use um, contract attorneys. You better call the applicant's attorney up a week before the depot. I try and get the thing going before a week before. Who's going to show up? Is it going to be a contract? If it's a contract, you better ask the attorney who's handling it. Let's try and settle it now. Because it's been my experience. It's very rare 
a contract attorney has authority to settle. There are a few exceptions, but there's so few that you remember who they are. Like I said, does the applicant's attorney like to settle? Some like to settle and get it out of here. Other ones, they're never going to settle. They're going to send a contract attorney that won't even talk to you about the thing. Okay. All right, I think that's our dividing point, right, Gary? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought I was doing the contract attorney slide, but I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, just a little extra note on that. Um, obviously, there are some contract attorneys who have settlement authority, but obviously most don't. So as Gary said, calling the applicant's attorney well in advance of the depot to find out that issue, you probably you know, find out, oh, we're sending a contract attorney. Fine. Who is that person? Can I get his or her number? Well, they don't have settlement authority. Great. So let's talk to the handling attorney. You know, just get to the right person so that you can discuss a settlement beforehand helps a lot because I'm sure as claims examiners, uh, those of you out there, you've gotten, I don't know how many depot reports from your defense attorney that says, well, we had the depot. It went forward as scheduled. The attorney uh, appearing was a contract attorney, didn't have settlement authority, so we couldn't discuss settlement. Garbage. There's no reason that that scenario couldn't have resulted in a settlement if there was just some advance reconnaissance done a couple days beforehand. It's an easy, easy problem to avoid. Can I Absolutely. ask a question before you move on, Scott? Of course. We have a few different people who are asking about the Batista case. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, they are asking what it is, if they can get a copy of it. Uh, and I think one person was just asking you to clarify the name of the case. So would you talk a little bit about that really quick? Oh, Gary, do you, you were covering that one. You were talking about Sabrosa? No, no, Batista, the Batista decision. Yeah. It came out about six months ago, seven months ago. Basically it expanded the cases. To a real quick Reader's Digest version of it is they've now stated that if there's a dispute, and that's the big word, and they talked about it at CAW too, any dispute, the applicant's entitled to a panel. So let's say um, they put on um, diabetes, and it's a pre-existing condition. They've had diabetes for a number of years, but they put diabetes and they want to get, well, they first start with an ortho panel, and then they send you additional panels for an internal. And I go, where's the internal issue? Well, we put diabetes, but I don't see diabetes with, you know, none of the medical records. It's a dispute. And the judges are saying, in the Batista decision, any dispute, they're entitled to a panel. And you go down there and go, the no doctor said there's diabetes. It's a pre-existing condition. The doctor and the judge will tell you it's a dispute. He gets a panel. And that's why the cases now are exploding with panels because of that one decision. All righty. Uh, moving on. Um, EDD. How many settlements have we had? Uh, pending that got ruined because someone didn't call EDD in time. You sign settlement documents and then, oops, EDD paid $26,000, right? So best thing to do is get a hold of EDD days, not minutes before the deposition, because since COVID, obviously, we're, uh, we're all virtual or remote. A lot of EDD people work from home. So best to find out well in advance whether you have an EDD issue. So you can put that in the settlement documents, just increases your likelihood of uh, getting the thing resolved. And if EDD didn't pay, I've learned uh, at least ask if they have applied for benefits because I had this one case come up a few months ago, actually, um, where the applicant had applied for benefits, but EDD had not yet made a determination. So, um, so I told them, okay, we're settling the case, fine, move on, got the CNR approved, no problem. I put down in the lien affidavit, like a good little defense attorney, EDD paid no benefits, confirmed, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a week later, I got a lien from EDD for benefits paid in the amount of several thousand dollars. It turns out that they paid retroactively back to months before because we had had a, a modified duty issue, the applicant abandoned her job, so we were disputing TD. Well, EDD paid them. Now, as it turns out, they paid after the order approving was issued 
and they noted that in their internal document. So it was no issue. We got it. We got it withdrawn. It was fine. But in the case where EDD has not yet paid, but may, it probably would behoove everyone on the defense side to let EDD know in writing, look, we're settling the case. If you pay, fine, we can't stop you, but don't come crying to us when you want your money back because we're, we're done. So um, it could have become an issue if, let's say, I went to get the CNR approved the day after I called EDD, but for whatever reason, we didn't get it approved, or there's an order suspending for some ridiculous technical issue. That happens in Long Beach sometimes. And if we didn't get the order approving until, let's say, a month or two later, that could be a substantial EDD benefit that we'd have hanging out there, and they would then want their money back because they paid before the order approving. So staying in regular contact with EDD is absolutely critical if you think there may possibly be an issue um, because it can really ruin a settlement in a hurry. Yeah, let me add something, Scott. Also, when you're talking to the adjuster getting authority, getting authority for 5710, always ask the adjuster, can I get a benefit printout? Go over the benefit printout with the adjuster. Ask, and what do you have for average weekly wage? What do you have for TTD rate? Has any TTD been paid? Write down the dates. Look at the the benefit printout, mark the dates. Has any PD been paid? Usually not because it's a new case, but you have to ask. Then I get this all the time. Well, you don't have to call EDD because they're getting TTD. Wrong, wrong, call EDD. I have had, I've got two on my desk right now where I just got them settled and I got a hold of EDD finally and we're paying TTD and there's double dipping all over the place. And that is a huge deal because that'll put the brakes on every settlement I know. Because when there's double dipping, you're going to trial because no applicant's attorney is going to go, oh, you're right. Let's just pay EDD out of the applicant's funds. No, they're going to fight that all the way. They don't want that. And you're going to have to say, okay, fine. Here's the benefit print. You're going to have to go to trial. Here's the benefit printout. Here's EDD. We have a big problem. So to save yourself the problem, even if they're paying TTD, check with EDD. That's all coming up in the slides. <laughs> so we saved ourselves a couple of minutes. Thank you. Uh, the duplicate benefit issue, obviously, Gary just talked about it. It's critical. Um, yeah, I don't need to talk about that again. And as anyone who's been a defense attorney for more than about 25 minutes knows, you can't just check EMS for an EDD lien. They oftentimes don't pay or they don't file a lien for whatever reason. So you really got to call and confirm it to make sure you're not putting your client on a hook because it's going to be a huge issue, obviously. Uh, final version of the CNR with you at the deposition. Um, obviously, we're doing it by Zoom quite a bit these days. But um, if you're in person, have the final version. There's no reason to start arguing over language at the time of the deposition. At least preempt any issues by having what you want the applicant and applicant's attorney to sign with you at the time. If it's by Zoom, obviously you can't do that. So get it to applicant's attorney the day before or two days before. You know, applicant's attorneys, they don't get paid for, you know, looking at their file in advance. Uh, they get their 15% at the end of the case. Maybe they'll get a, a retroactive TD issue along the way. Uh, hopefully not. Um, and then they get 5710 fees. So anytime you can prompt an applicant's attorney to look at their file, say, hey, here's a CNR. Let's you know, let's take a look, see if we can get this resolved, the better. You're just increasing your likelihood of uh, getting, getting the thing resolved. Uh, as Gary mentioned, um, know what benefits pay, were paid beforehand, not at the time of the deposition. It just increases the likelihood that you're not going to have a problem. TD paid, medical paid, uh, like you said, get the benefit printout. Uh, you don't want to leave those things to the, the very last second. And you're going to need the benefit printout anyway. It's always good to send the benefit printout to the applicant's attorney. It makes you look like you're really trying to get it settled, and it pushes him along just that much farther. He's going to look at the benefit printout, see that everything you're saying is true, and he's going to go along with the settlement and push the applicant for you. Right. And there are even judges who will want to look at benefit notices or they'll want to confirm 
benefits paid. It doesn't happen too often, obviously, but you know, we need to make sure that the, the amounts in the CNR match the benefit printout. They match what the benefit notices say. So in case you get a, a really involved judge, you're covered. Um, how much plus, was paid? Oh, go ahead. Plus, now it's a new thing with the judges. They all want verification on the amount the medicals have been paid. And when you get the benefit printout, if it matches the medicals, I've had a lot of judges look at the CNR for the medicals and cross-check it with the benefit printout. And if there's a difference, they won't sign it. So they're looking for that and they're asking for the benefit printout and they're looking for the medicals. So that's a big deal with a lot of these people. Yeah, that wasn't so much an issue back in, well, I'll say the early days, 15, 20 years ago. But, um recently the last few years a lot more judges are asking for medical i mean it's a it's a blank line on the cnr so it should be a, it be there anyway but yeah it's it's more of a common commonly asked issue these days uh voucher you know a lot of times we you know it's easy to well you not worry about the voucher but y you got to have it all prepared at the time you're going to uh, talk about the cnr it's a six thousand dollar difference right so um what language are you going to be putting in the CNR? Obviously, we can't resolve the voucher issue if it's admitted post SB 863, but we can still protect ourselves on the defense side. If the applicant is not MMI, I will put the applicant is not at maximum medical improvement. There is no medical report uh, indicating the existence of permanent disability. Therefore, the applicant is not eligible for a voucher. Now, that's not a resolution of the voucher issue per se, but it is language that's going to protect us down the road if the applicant wants to be slimy and say, hey, I want my voucher now. Uh, one of the things is when you send over a CNR that applicants attorneys notoriously write, defendants will provide voucher within 30 days. I cross that out. I call the applicant's attorney. I'm not going to let that in the CNR. I always call the adjuster first and have to ask them how they feel about it. But I'm very um wary of putting something into a CNR where I'm obligated to pay that within 30 days. Because if there's an order and that's in the CNR, you're going to be held to that as an order. And they're going to come back and look for sanctions and interests and costs on that because there's an order that the voucher had to be provided. I usually tell the adjuster, if they're okay with sending the voucher, send it right now. And then once I confirm they got the voucher, then I'll put the CNR through and I'll get that language out of there. But I'm very wary about putting voucher 30 day time limits in the CNR because it's one more thing I don't want my client being responsible for, especially on a time period with an order. Good thought uh, on post-term cases. Uh, this is another thing that more and more judges as the years go by are, are being a little more picky about. Um, they want specifics. You know, the, the generic language is uh, defense alleges that the applicant did not report an industrial injury until after the date of termination. Well, better to have, uh, will uh, defendant will introduce uh, evidence uh, you know, in the form of testimony from applicant supervisor, the name, and give the specific basis, the specific offer of proof as to why it was denied on a post-term basis. Some judges will not um, approve a Beltran uh, finding unless you put something very, very specific. Some won't approve them at all, but the more specific, the better in terms of the judges who really want that specific language. Um, Always better to use an offer of proof, especially if you're in Long Beach. The judges there can be different. We'll leave it at that. Uh, so the more specific we can be, the better. Uh, have the witness information and exactly what they would testify to. Any evidence is, is, is better than no evidence, as long as it's uh, in compliance with the CNR. Uh, have you addressed Medicare issues? So is the applicant 62 and a half? So they're within 30 months of Medicare eligibility. Do you need an MSA? You know, those are all things that should be covered before you talk to the applicant's attorney, before, you know, you can sign a CNR. Better to be taken care of and completed before you get the case settled. Obviously, you want to you know what those Medicare issues are. If you need an MSA, let's get it before 
stops you from settling a case. Obviously, that's not always possible. Um, child support issues, that goes along with duplicate benefits for uh, TD and EDD. Uh, they're probably going to ruin your case if the amount is is big enough. You know, we need to take care of that, make sure it's resolved, uh, comes out of the settlement proceeds. We need to take care of that beforehand because if you're going to walk through a, a CNR and you find out there's a child support issue, that CNR is, is not happening. And if it does, then you've just put your client at risk of having to resolve, you know, some child support issue when we knew about the lien beforehand. Um, TTD overpayment, obviously it needs to be in there. Uh, verify PDAs. Uh, Gary mentioned that earlier. Uh, biggest biggest problem in the world, you get a CNR approved, PDAs are listed as zero, and then you find out, oh, we paid $37,143 in PDAs. Why was it not in the CNR? Okay, then, then there's an issue. So obviously you want to get that in writing so everyone's on the same page. Get the payment ledger, make sure everything's coordinated so you don't have that huge issue because, you know, Obvious reasons. I don't need to explain the problems there. I wanted to mention. Can you go back to M the MSA's yeah. Medicare issues? People think that you can't settle a case if a person is 65, 66, 67 because you have to run an MSA. That's not true. I find Medicare cases the easiest ones because I call the applicants or I get the authority from the client. I don't care how much the injury is, how much the MSA is. I tell the client, you better throw something out there 24 five and try and get this thing settled. Because by saying right out of the gate, listen, the applicant's 66 years old, I got 24 five. What you're really telling that applicant's attorney is, that MSA is going to be huge. And if you want to get a CNR, this is your time. Because if it comes in and you got medical reports that rate this guy at 25, 30%, and you want future med, we're going to step the case out. Because running the MSA, we're going to come up with a $250,000, $300,000 medical bill. It's not going to happen. You want your CNR? Get it now. And I see it a lot of settlements where I was very surprised they, they accepted it because I can see that the case would rate high, but they wanted their money right now and the applicant's attorney told them the way he's talking i don't think we'll ever get a cnr and you want to be tethered to this case for the rest of your life trying to go through ur hell and um begging for future medical care or do you just want to get your 24 or 5 now and walk away and you'd be surprised how many times they'll just go i'd rather get the money right now and if you sit there and go well i'll order order 15 maybe they'll take it if you're going to play the medicare card and say the person's 66 and all you better come in at 24 5 or you're going to lose your credibility they know what's going on applicants attorneys are not stupid they know that if you're playing the medicare card the chances of you coming up with a compromise or release get diminished greatly if they turn it down and i have a lot of clients now that won't even run msa's because running an MSA is expensive and they'll do a preliminary search and see what kind of medications the applicant's on and go, I'm not going to pay for an MSA. I know this thing's going to be sky high. Off to stipulation land we go. So you can settle Medicare cases. You just got to know, is the person over 65? What kind of is? And run it by your adjuster. Let her know where you're going with it. Most times they want to get the case settled too, and they'll give you the authority for the 24-5. Okay. Gotcha. All right. And one other quick thing about verifying PDAs. This is not necessarily a settlement issue, but just as a side note, uh, it, it is so critical to make sure the PDA number is correct for obvious reasons. But also I've had adjusters tell me, well, let, we'll have to just uh, file a recon and get it fixed. Well, I mean, you can do that. However, it's the defendant who typically prepares the CNR and ambiguities generally are resolved against the party that drafted the document. So it's not a foregone conclusion that you can just file your, file your recon and get it fixed. So just a little FYI. All right, final considerations. Uh, Gary talked about that one two minutes ago, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, the 25,000 threshold, he kind of covered that one as well. And uh, the MSA thing for 65-year-olds, 
you know, I generally leave that to the adjuster and the insurance company guidelines to determine whether you want to get an MSA. Obviously, you know, CMS approval, that's a, that's a, a voluntary process. We never need, need to do that, but um, you get different answers on, the, on, this last, on this last paragraph here, but I, I typically would feel uncomfortable not adequately protecting Medicare's interests, but that's just me. So um, either way on that one. Know the value of your case before the morning of the deposition. Of course, obviously. Um, that goes along with the applicant not being MMI. Uh, do your analysis, throw the future medical on there, look at the objectives so that when applicant's attorney says, yeah, let's settle, I'd like $80,000. You as the defense attorney are not flabbergasted, not knowing whether that's a good deal or not. So um, looking at your file beforehand will pay a lot of dividends. Uh, get settlement authority before the deposition, and I don't mean nine minutes before, I mean five days before. Uh, that way you can avoid those 20, 30, 40 minute delays while you're paying 57, 10 fees waiting to get someone on the phone. Let's do that beforehand, obviously. Um, makes things a lot easier. Uh, and if you can't for some reason, and even if, even if you do, maybe you have to come up an extra $2,500 or $250, whatever it is, uh, always good to have someone with settlement authority available at the time of deposition so you know you can make adjustments on the fly and get the case settled and not lose an opportunity to get the applicant to sign while she's there or he's there. Um, some, of these, some of these applicants are tough to get a hold of once you, once you send them on their way. Yeah, can I add something on that? I mean, I've always thought the best, I, I think it's a sin anytime you get in a situation with the injured worker and the applicant's attorney, and you're not trying to settle the case. And I always have that adjuster, I get her cell number, and I go, in case something happens, if there's, you know, you get hit by a lightning, who's your backup? And I get their number too. Because like Scott said, you never know what happens at these depositions when you know your authority is not enough if they want a little bit more 5710 fees if they want you know can you come up an extra 2500 uh 2500 dollars can i get a voucher thrown in at the last second i don't know but you're going to have to run it through the adjuster and you're going to have to have somebody there and as long as everybody's there at the depot it's your best time to try and get it settled and you want somebody with authority available. So I always make sure my, my bases are covered. I have everybody's number, it's all right there. So when if there is a glitch in it, you have somebody to call immediately. And if your adjuster got hit by a car on the way in, you got the replacement right there. There we go. All right, and I just, I haven't been good about checking the, the questions. Karen was asking, uh, what if a settlement is agreed before the day Day before the depot, still approve more than one hour of 5710 fees? The answer is who knows, but maybe. Um, everything's negotiable. And yeah, as long, as long as it's reasonable, I mean, we can use that as, you know, a kind of a wink wink to get it settled because, you know, it gives the applicant's attorney more incentive. You don't never, you don't ever want to give the farm away, obviously. We got to be reasonable, but 5710 fees are a pretty, pretty valuable tool to get cases settled and it just costs you a few hundred extra dollars. Oh, let me add something to that. I still go forward with the depot and I put the depot on and I go, it, are you agreeing to this? And with no coercion and no help from anybody, free, free will of yourself. And the applicant goes, yeah. And yeah, how come you want to do the depot? And the applicant says, I want the money. I want to get out of the system. And why do I do that? Because I have been held up by judges numerous times. Well, how do I know he really wants to settle? I bring the depot transcript with me and I show, here's the depot. Here it is. He says, I want the money. I want to get out of the system. Please pay me. I want to settle. And when, an when the judge looks at that, I always get my order approving. So I go on with the depot anyway, and it's really fast. It only takes three minutes. But I have the applicant tell me, I want my money. I want to settle. I want to get out of the system. And that's usually good enough to get my order approving. Tammy, I know that's a, you're, you're, the, the, the time monitor is back on the screen. I <laughs> The time monitor, I like it. Um, 
There's an issue, a couple of things being discussed that I wanted to bring to your attention on our Q&A section here. Um, Maureen, our friend Maureen had responded a little bit ago and she said that there is a lien and uh, clearance sheet that you can fax and EDD responds very quickly this way. She's had really good luck this way. Have you heard of that? Yes. No. Uh, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Go on. Go oh. on. A lien clearance sheet. Um, well, EDD has one that they typically use down in San Diego. They don't use it in Orange County. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure if that was what she was referring to. I apologize if I missed it. Yeah, I'm not sure either. But such as people were asking, hey, can I get that lien clearance sheet? So she did say she was going to send it over to me. So I will attach it uh, with your certificates and you can take a look at it, everyone, if you'd like. But I know everybody was really interested in that lien clearance sheet. Um, I was like, people still use fax? Is that still a thing? Um, <laughs> the other question that was being discussed a lot, um, sorry, I have to find that there's a bunch of questions in here. It was about Medicare. Um, go ahead and I'll find it and I'll have it ready when you when you finish. Okay. Yeah, I know we're running up against it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the employer, yeah, Gary kind of talked about that. We'll let that one go. I don't need to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's all about probability. So I'm a math guy. I've always been that way. I'm kind of a freak uh, about it. Don't judge me. Um, but I just think everything is a cost utility, uh, cost benefit analysis or risk reward. So the more we can do in terms of the stuff we've talked about, the steps we can take to get cases settled is just going to increase the likelihood that we can get it resolved at the deposition. And it seems like a lot of times, a lot of these things we've talked about don't happen in advance. I know it's easier sometimes not to do them, but it really, I found, it really increases the chance that you'll walk away with a signed CNR. Oh, this is just a cute little squirrel picture, which I knew you'd love. Uh, I don't have ducks or a row. I have squirrels and they're everywhere. Just good to be organized. You know, I, I fall victim to not being organized from time to time as well. But again, if we can do the things we talked about beforehand and be prepared and, you know, so forth and, uh, we're in a much better position to get the thing resolved, get the case closed, and move on to the next one. And I I'll think leave it with that's this. It. You know, I was told very early in my career by a very wise judge that every case has three golden opportunities to settle early and for less money. And every time you get everybody together, you should grab that opportunity. And I think the deposition is the best time to try and get out of a case early and have everybody win. I think the other thing that people wanted to clarify, um, I'll read you the two questions. It's about MSAs and age. Um, the first one is to clarify, so we can CNR if the, if, uh, the injured worker is 67 without running an MSA. And then the other one on the same topic there is I have one case where the claimant is 61. He wants to settle via CNR. Do I need to refer to an MSA? Can you clarify that? Sure. Um, the 67-year-old, uh, you can do it. I, I, I don't. I, I wouldn't unless I'm told very specifically, we're not by the adjuster or by someone in authority at the insurance company, we're not doing it. I would feel more comfortable doing it. Uh, without a doubt, that's just the way I do it. Um, the 61-year-old, uh, you don't have to do it, but we have to adequately uh, protect Medicare's interests, you know, whatever that means to you. So if, if we know there's a ton of future medical, it, it doesn't hurt to get an MSA. So, you know, MSA rarely comes back against people and, you know, says, hey, you didn't do this right, but who wants to be the guy <laughs> to set that example? So, um, Gary, if you have something different, feel free. Well, I think that on the 67-year-old, if you settle that for 24 five you're going to be okay i don't think they're going to come after you but if the 61 year old is getting medicare and you know it you're going to have to run something or it's got to be settled for underneath twenty five thousand dollars. and i mean not 24 999 you better give yourself a little cushion there i mean the bottom line is it's twenty five thousand. i just settled a couple of them they were 67 years old and neither one of them got more than 24 five and we didn't run an MSA on it. But the adjuster said, I'm comfortable with that. And we let it alone and went through and that they're over. So, but in, on the hindsight, a 61 year old, 
that's saying, I'm getting Medicare right now, you're you're gonna have to fulfill it. You're gonna have to get if this thing settles for more than twenty-five thousand dollars, you're gonna have to run it. That's okay. what happens. We are about a minute over. Thank you both so very much. That was a lot of fantastic information. Um, thank you all for attending. Our May webinar is going to be on May 22nd on practice tips for drafting stipulations with Greg Fletcher. It's going to be another great one. Sign up now if you'd like, and certificates will be sent out to you this afternoon. Thank you all again. Have a great rest of your week, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.